Good evening, everyone. After wonderful presentations and a lot of input from various fields on this very special topic of Fukushima, it is now my turn to talk about nuclear workers in pre- and post-Fukushima Japan. My name is Felix Jawinski and I'm a research assistant at the University of Leipzig and I'm taking my PhD in Japan Studies Institute. I'm working on nuclear labor and the working conditions in Japan, especially since 2014 and, also, and I'm interested in this topic since 2017 in the case of Germany. Right now I'm working in a project where we focus on the peaceful and the militaristic or the military use of nuclear energy in post-war Japan. Let me come first to the outline what is my talk about today. First, I want to show you some facts and numbers of nuclear workers, then, sh then talk a little bit about publications um, that are available in Japanese. I want to go further into details on labor issues in Fukushima, but this is not only this is not meaning that those labor issues are only present in Fukushima, but also in the whole nuclear industry in Japan and even in other countries. Um, on the first point, I want to give you some remarks on closed and ongoing court cases in Japan from nuclear workers. And the last point will be that I will talk about um, the opportunities for nuclear power plant workers to get supported by labor unions. Well, when we talk about nuclear labor, um, many people will think about those people here on the left side. Those people working in the operation floors employed by the energy companies, working in clean and rather safe working environments. But ever since the nuclear industry um, became such a big business and ever since nuclear power plants have been built, um, subcontractors were needed to keep nuclear power plants working, and for, especially for the maintenance work. So here in the middle you can see pictures from Higuchi Kenji that he took in the 1970s in different nuclear power plants. On the right upper corner you can see nuclear workers working near the tanks in Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And since 2011 we have another kind of nuclear workers that are many times they are forgotten, those people working in the, de um, in the exclusion zone, in the security zone, where they decontaminate the whole area. Houses, gardens, streets, pathways, whatever you can think of. The nuclear industry, as in many other countries, is structured as a pyramid and hierarchical. So on top here the case with Fukushima Daiichi that so this chart was made by Watanabe Hiroyuki. Um, on the top you can see here Tokyo Electric Power, so TEPCO, and they have prime contractors. Um, those prime contractors they have first level subcontractors again, and this goes down to the six, sevens, and even some sources say it goes down to the eight, nines level of subcontracting in Japan. When we talk about nuclear laborers in Japan and ask ourselves, okay, how many people are actually working there, I want to show you some figures and numbers. Um, what we can see here clearly is in the 1970s when many nuclear power plants were built in Japan, the number of workers rose dramatically and then got on a high level ever since. So what you can see here, the energy company employs is the black part and the gray part are the subcontract workers. What you can already see here that the subcontract workers always outnumbered the people working in the energy company. So this chart here shows the numbers from, the, from 1970 till 2008. In, so these are the numbers for all nuclear workers all over Japan. Here on this chart, so 9,324, and TEPCO employs roughly 1,400. 
and those numbers you can see here again. Um, when we think about nuclear labor and especially looking on the German case, um, there's what I always got conf get confronted with is that there are not many publications and wide known books about this kind of work working environment. Um, the case in Japan is slightly different. What we can see here is uh, so is that there is a lot of literature on nuclear labor and nuclear laborers. Um, many of them are actually conducted by journalists, but also by scientists, lawyers, and unionists. Um, you can find books and articles from artists. Um, you find books from low qualified um, workers, meaning subcontract workers. You even find books from relatives um, of nuclear power plant workers, mainly people who lost their son due to a radiation accident. But you also find pro and anti-nuclear books um, written by engineers and high qualified technicians. What you can see here is that the, the number of books written on or by nuclear workers changed over time. So in the 1960s, 70s, you only had a few books written in this time, but it changed in the, in the end 1970s and the beginning of the 80s. So even before Chernobyl, you had plenty of books written about this topic coming from but this comes from the initiative of labor unions and activists that tried to make public the labor issues the workers faced at that time when working conditions were really harsh in nuclear power plants in Japan. Then of course you have the peak after Chernobyl again, so when many books were even published in Japan on this topic, on the Japanese um, case, and then in the 90s, the interest or the public interest on this topic was rather low. And then you can see the big peak here again after Fukushima. So in 2011, you already had 33 books published on this topic. In 2012, you had 45 books published on the topic of nuclear labor in Japan. And this graph here ends in March 2017, but I'm sure I would conduct um, this research until today, I'm sure I could find many, many more books. Some of them I'm going to produce very soon. What you can see here is that I selected some works um, on nuclear worker or, or nuclear work, um, mainly coming from pre-Fukushima and post-Fukushima times. So here, Gemba no Gemba, um, this one here, um, Genshiro Hibaku Nikki, um, then this one here, Hangen Batsuroro Undo, um, and even this one here on the right upper corner and the right corner at the bottom. Um, those are all books written on nuclear labor um, that are focusing on this topic and written by journalists or even. Um, activists. This book here right in the middle is written by a labor union concentrating on labor issues and their fight for better working conditions in nuclear power plants in Japan. And of course you have post-Fukushima publications like this one here, Genpa Dosha by Terao Saho, um, a very short but very impressive book because um, she is focusing on those people who actually work in nuclear power plants and give gives those people a voice showing that their cases are pretty much alike before and after Fukushima. The book here, Fukushima Daiichi Genpa Zuhairo Zukan, is a rather pro-nuclear book by Kainuma Hiroshi, a sociologist um, from Ritsumeikan University and the mangaka Tatsuta, so a guy who worked at Fukushima 
Daiichi nuclear power plant and his manga got really famous when he published it I think in 2013 or 14 and even is translated into German and English. Um, here you have some reports on nuclear labor um, again by Higuchi Kenji, so the famous photographer who worked on this issue since the 1970s and here is even a um, short summary of cases and um, legal and loyal issues um, that is conducted by the um, Japanese Federation for Lawyers. Three books I want to mention very briefly um, that are very important to me are uh, Yami ni Kasareru Genpatsu Hibaksha by Higuchi Kenji, so Nuclear Laborers Hidden in the Dark from 1981, where he's already showing um, the discrepancy between the energy company employees and the subcontract workers and what kind of working conditions they face in those times. Um, another one is from 2013, and, that, and I mean, I'm not a physicist, but um, here in this book you already have the physician Murata Saburo, and he wrote some parts of the books, um, some parts of the book are written by him, and he is focusing on health issues um, and working in a nuclear power plant. And the most recent and most extensive book is probably Katayama Natsuko from 2020, where she's showing diaries of Fukushima nuclear power plant workers. There's also a very um, interesting book that I just want to mention here. It is um, written by Takaki Kazumi, a sociologist uh, from Gifu University, who has conducted field research on nuclear laborers already in 1984, 5, 6, around that time um, in Suruga, in Suruga nuclear power plant. And then she published some of her articles, even in English, um, after Fukushima. And she has <coughs> published a um, extensive um, research report in a large book in 2018 or 19, where she is um, giving report on all the laborers she has done interviews with. That is not only 10 or 20, but m hundreds of workers she has talked to and reported their cases for after, so for future generations. Um, and additionally to those books written on nuclear laborers, you have books written by nuclear laborers in Japan and plenty of them and some of them I picked out. Um, one of them is Horie Kunio, um, Genpatsu Rodosha, so nuclear power plant workers from the 1980s. Um, another book written by him is Genpatsu Gypsy, so the nuclear gypsies, as they called themselves in the 80s. Um, another one here at the right upper corner is Denki ga nakunakute mo chito wa shinanai. So even if um, energy um, would be, so even if there would be no energy, nobody would die. By um, Kimura Toshio, a former TEPCO employee who worked at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant for many years and then quit his job due to um, his security concerns in the beginning of the 2000s. Um, this book here at the right corner at the bottom, um, this is a testimony of a technician who wrote his experience after working um, 40 years in Fukushima. Um, one, the book in the middle here, Fukushima Genpatsu, Sagyoin no Ki, is a report by Ikeda Minoru, and he worked as a de um, decontamination worker in the security zone, and afterwards he worked as a decontamination worker at Fukushima Nuclear Daiichi Power Plant. And he wrote about his experience and what he saw and what kind of labor issues um, he experienced in the short period of time he worked there in this book, which is unfortunately not translated yet. The labor issues I'm talking about with, um, so some of them I want to mention here, 
Um, to put it very short, one is um, the pseudo service contract labor, then we have rec offs, we have obligation to sign letters of confidentiality, and the problem of measuring the labor time. Um, when I'm talking about false service contract labor, I need to explain first what is a normally dispatched labor. Um, if you have service contract la labor um, for a normal labor dispatchment, you have the contract labor company um, and you have the laborer and you have the contractor who's normally having a service contract with the contract labor company. But in this case, um, the contractor, so the actually people working at the site are not allowed to give directives to the laborer directly, but they need to contact the contract labor company and they give directives to the laborer. Um, if this system is used in a different way, um, then the contractor gives directives to the laborer even, even if he's not allowed um, by law. Um, so, meaning that someone works at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, um, but he's also only employed at a service contract, um, and this, but working there, it makes it really hard for the people um, from the contractor's company to always first call contract labor companies, and they should then call the laborer directly. So, what is happening is that they give directives to the laborer, even if they are not allowed to, and the problem with that is, that they are treated the same way as dispatched laborers, so as if um, the laborer from this point would be dispatched to this contractor's company directly, but this is not the case. Um, so they are treated at, as dispatched laborers, but of course get paid less because service contract laborers get paid less than dispatched laborers. Another problem I want to mention here is in Japanese it's called pinhane. Pinhana or Rakoff. I mean, the illustration on the right side shows it very clearly, I think. Um, you have TEPCO that is paying an average day wage of 50,000 to 100,000 yen per worker, meaning rough, around about 400 to 800, 900 euro. And then this goes down to the salary, meaning that TEPCO pays a lot of money but of course you have the uh, prime contractors, they take their charge and then you have the first subcontractor and the second subcontractor and then you have the worker that is mainly getting at this level here, down here, maybe 6 to 12,000 yen per day, meaning that is about 50 to 100 euro daily wage. Another labor issue many laborers reported to me and to other sources are the so-called letters of confidentiality. One example of this is was published in 2011 and it says Article 4, Obligation to Confidentiality. Secondly, one must keep all information regardless of written or spoken or even things one just heard that one came to know while working inside or outside of the area of nuclear power plant Fukushima Daiichi operated by TEPCO absolutely secret. Furthermore, one is not allowed to provide or circulate any information regarding this employment to any media company. Another example for that is from my interviews in 2016 in Nagoya that I conducted with a decontamination worker from the Philippines. And he said, well, when we entered the company in Fukushima, the boss told us basically two things. First, that we get more radioactively contaminated when we eat food from the microwave than by working in Fukushima. Therefore, therefore, we should not be worried at all. And second, that we are all not allowed to take pictures while working, that we are not allowed to talk to anyone about our work, and that we all have to sign a letter of confidentiality, which has the clause that if we should talk about our work, they could fine us with a penalty up to 50 million yen. So roughly 500,000 euro or dollar. And these reports were really shocking. Um, another issue all nuclear workers all over the world face is pressure and stress by radiation time, meaning that they feel stressed due to the fact that they only have a limit of or a maximum limit 
of radiation they can get exposed to while working at nuclear facilities. One example to solve this um, problem, so-called, um, is given by Umeda Ryusuke, a former nuclear laborer who even had a um, court case fighting for compensation money when he got sick. So Umeda said in an interview, he said, well, you can't really work when it's so the, um, the dosimeter, the radiation counter, is peeping. And then the interview asks, so what did you do? Well, I took it off and gave it to some uncle. An uncle? And Umida continued, yeah, a guy only doing this. Well, there was someone only doing this job? And Umida answered, well, yes, he was old. His daily wage was the same as ours. We called him beep killer. He killed the sounds of the dosimeter. This kind of job existed at that time in 1979, probably in every nuclear power plant. When I gave him my dosimeter, it showed two or three millisieverts. But when I looked at my records later, I could only find 0.8 millisieverts. That's what we called a trick. And this report is from 1979. And it's nothing different in Fukushima. Not in all cases, but you can find these kind of cases even today. They put lead around their dosimeters. Um, they, in brackets of course, they forget them in the changing rooms or they just put them outside of the facility when they enter high radioactive um, spots. And the case in March 2011 was that in some days up to 180 workers had to work without dosimeters because they weren't enough available. Therefore, they just got the same radiation amounts as other workers from the same group and mostly the head workmen, the so-called hancho. Um, the difference is that the hancho is not always working at the same places as his fellows. Therefore, his radiation amount would be way lower than those by his co-workers. And now let me come to the Fourth point, comments on closed and open court cases. Um, this is a point with, that I'm not so much familiar with, but I can give you some hints of what is going on. Until now, um, only 18 cases have been approved as occupational diseases coming from the nuclear industry. Um, the basic approvals is a minimum of milli 5 millisieverts and minimum one year of work in a radioactive contaminated area in Japan. Um, if you take this um, numbers, this could mean that only in 2011, more than 10,000 workers exceeded this 5 millisievert. So in the future, of course, there should be more and more cases that get occupational diseases and even got, get um, compensations if they get, for example, leukemia. Um, but this 5 millisievert is only the case for leukemia. If you, for example, have a, a stomach cancer, you need a minimum amount for an approval of 100 millisievert. One publication I want to mention here is um, Genpats to Tatakau, so fighting with a nuclear power plant, report on the court case of Iwasa's irradiation in a nuclear power plant from 1988. This is actually one of the first cases that was, that was fought at the court in Japan to get compensation money from the energy company. Another work that was just published recently is the book here on the left side, Genpatsu Hibaku Rosai, so occupational diseases coming from work at the nuclear facilities. Um, the problems the workers face normally when they sue an energy company, that the process is very long, so you have very long juridical processes. The costs for this is very high or are really high. The workers, they normally need a support network um, that, were, that I will explain very soon. And you have all, always the problem that the exposure doses is depending on the illness and only a limited number of illnesses can be approved 
at all. So those are some of the issues the workers face. And if you are interested in how this process of getting approved as an occupational disease, I highly recommend you this book here, because this is giving a large overview of what kind of cases have been fought and are still ongoing and how the process works legally and what kind of um, proof needs to be done to show that one's illness is definitely coming from working at a nuclear power plant. And one case that is very prominent right now is the so-called Arakabu Saiban, a worker who worked for TEPCO and KEPCO, even in Fukushima Daiichi and Daini, and he got leukemia and is now suing TEPCO and KEPCO, and, this, and his court case started in 2017. And in March 2021, he has a 17th court session, um, and there is no end in sight. Um, if you're interested in that, please um, contact the people from this, his support network or even me and I can give you further, further information on that. Um, the last point I want to mention here are some remarks on the support by labor unions. Um, one of the first labor unions um, that was found to support especially subcontract workers is the so-called Genpatsu Bukai, founded in 19. 81 by Saito Seiji and as he got harassed by the Yakuza and his employees and even by the police um, he quitted this work in 1982 so one and a half years after he started it but his experience on his fight against the um, employers and um, the labor conditions in the nuclear industry so his um, knowledge became highly valuable valuable after 3.11. Another example I want to mention is the so-called support center for nuclear power plant irradiated workers, um, founded in the late 80s by Hirai Norio, who was a former engineer and specialist for nuclear power plant constructions. And he became critical to the nuclear industry when he was asked to cover up a contamination scandal in the beginning of the 1980s. And then when he reported this case um, to the press in the end 1980s, um, he was dispatched to Nigeria by his employer as a penalty. Unfortunately, um, his expertise was lost in 1996 when he suddenly died and he couldn't support uh, nuclear power plants, court cases anymore as an expert. And the, unfortunately, there was no successor to his center so there was no such kind of um, support center for nuclear power plant, mostly subcontract workers, until 2011. An example that became established really soon was the so-called Hibakurodo Kangaidu Netwaku, so the network to think about irradiated labor or nuclear labor. And this was founded in 2012 as a successor of, a, of another project that was established in April, so one, roughly one month after the accident at Fukushima nuclear power plant. And this was, for the first time, was not only an initiative by unionists, but a cooperation of labor unions, labor standard offices, centers for work safety and occupational health, physicists, scientists, um, physicians, journalists, activists, lawyers, and this is something new, current and firmer nuclear power plant workers. Um, some publications by this group I have um, shown you here on the right side. Um, the first one, the other one here is um, a rather broad explanation of what is actually meant by nuclear power plant work. Um, the blue book down here is on decontamination work, especially, and the other one here I've already mentioned that is explaining um, the court cases and the process of becoming approved as an occupational disease. Um, some years later, the so-called Counseling Center for Nuclear Workers in Fukushima, so Reconstruction, Decommissioning and Decontamination, was founded in 2015, and again this was a rather large group of politicians, labor unionists, scientists, activists, and former laborers. And here you are again with Saito Seiji, so the former nuclear power plant worker who founded a uh, labor union in the 1980s. 
And since 2019, um, there's a new group um, called Genpatsu Kanren Rodo Union. So a labor union for, um, regarding nuclear energy. It's a rather small group, um, now consisting of 10 members, and they try to start their activism um, in, 2000, in the end of 2019, and then Corona started, and unfortunately they were not able to fulfill what they tried to reach for. But what you can see here is again the book by uh, Ikeda Minoru, the guy you can see here, and he is the one who worked as a decontamination worker and as a uh, worker at a nuclear power plant. And they try to support the um, Arakabu case that I mentioned before and are also um, involved in some labor disputes with TEPCO right now. Let me come to a short conclusion. Um, Fukushima, for me, was not a turning point regarding um, the working conditions there, but made the existing problems visible. The discrepancy between subcontract workers and energy company employees is persistent and is still existing and it was existing ever since the nuclear industry started. And although labor issues are documented for the last 40 years and have not changed much, the hurdles for an acceptance of an occupational disease are still very high. And another point I want to mention at the end is, for many years only very few activists have cared for irradiated workers and only after Fukushima, so the accident, these issues became widely debated and were improved in some cases. I, it is my great pleasure to give you a short overview of what I've conducted in the last years and found out about this very special topic. I hope that we can have a short discussion now and if you're interested in this topic and want to have more information or even have um, deeper questions um, feel free to contact me on my email address and even if you want to have um, future scientific research collaborations thank you very much